and welcome everyone to uh, our new uh, series that's best of UEGW. Uh, I, I hope many of you have enjoyed uh, uh, previous episodes of best of DDW uh, in view of the fact that uh, uh, that UEGW was virtual this year and I know that many people didn't get to attend uh, and there were lots and lots of really sort of big trials released there. Uh, the decision was made uh, by David and Marla uh, uh, inviting James and I to take part in, in producing this Best of UEGW. Um, so it's slightly different uh, to uh, Best of DDW uh, in that we actually have some uh, presenters and you'll note on the right hand side of this slide you can see the names of Silvio Danese, Aristo Tan, uh, William Sanborn, uh, and Severine Vermeer, who will actually be doing a, a few recorded presentations as we go through. Um, as always, we have to thank our supporters without whom this would be possible. Uh, they have made this possible through educational grants. They have had absolutely no involvement in the content or development of the programme. Uh, it's multi-pharma sponsored, as you can see, and we're grateful to Amphi Amgen, Galapagos, Tillots and Takeda uh, for their generous uh, support of this programme. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to James, who's going to give you a little bit of an overview to help contextualise some of the data we're going to show you this evening. Please, please, please do feel free to ask questions in the question box at any time. We'll be popping into it every now and then to answer those questions. Uh, uh, we really enjoy getting your questions. It makes it a bit more interactive. Uh, uh, but I'm going to hand over to James now. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Pete. Uh, and, and I guess it's fair to say that one of the drivers, apart from the virtual format for UG this year, was, as Pete said, the huge number of really important clinical trials presented at UEGW, not just with uh, novel agents, but also some of our traditional agents. And if you look here on this slide far right, you can see that the licensed agents that we're currently using uh, form four different classes of drugs, and there's one or maybe uh, two agents in each of those classes. But if you look to the middle and uh, and to the left of the screen, you can see the vast array of new drugs in the pipeline, many of whom have different mechanisms of action than we are uh, traditionally used to. And as we move forward as these uh, these products come to market, uh, we're going to have to make some decisions based upon which is the most effective, most appropriate, most safe, uh, most appropriate sequence of these drugs, and even potentially which is the best combination of these drugs. And in order to do that, I think it probably does help to have a little bit of an understanding uh, of the immunopathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease and then focusing on which pathways are targeted by these agents. And, and clearly this is one of those slides that if you're not an immunologist uh, fills you with fear. But what I'm going to try and do is break it down into different steps uh, and, and also break the uh, different drugs down as to which step they affect. And, and I think we all know that inflammatory bowel disease occurs in genetically susceptible individuals often uh, associated with an environmental insult. Many of those environmental insults increase gut permeability, and if gut permeability is increased, you can get encroachment into the lamina propria with um, uh, 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 bacterial products, either the whole bacteria or what we call pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs. And traditionally, those get mopped up by members of the innate immune system, things like macrophages, which gobble them up uh, uh, by phagocytosis. Um, if they're not, uh, what can happen is uh, the process by which an antigen presenting cell, such as a dendritic cell here, can either sample the lumen or sample the lamina propria and present the PAMP, the bit of bacteria, to a naive lymphocyte. Uh, and in general, in health, uh, that process uh, uh, produces regulatory responses, homeostatic responses, uh, aim to uh, uh, reduce the inflammatory response to commensal bacteria uh, and food antigens. This process of antigen presentation actually happens in the mesenteric lymph node, but I've got it here just because it makes it more uh, uh, easier to expand on. So in, in health, this is a normal process that drives tolerance, but in the setting of inflammation, uh, uh, particularly uh, in the setting of IL-12, uh, you get the differentiation of 
Th1 effector lymphocytes. In the presence of uh, IL-23, you get Th17 effector lymphocytes. And these effector memory cells uh, will always uh, remember the antigen to which they have been uh, 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 differentiated in the presence of, and they will uh, maintain that inflammatory response should they meet that antigen again. So as mentioned, normally these are in the uh, uh, draining mesenteric lymph nodes and those effector memory lymphocytes, once they're differentiated from naive cells, will emigrate out of the uh, mesenteric lymph node along a gradient of a protein called sphingosine 1-phosphate. Uh, and this gradient allows the steady but slow uh, release of effector memory lymphocytes back into the mesenteric uh, vasculature and the general circulation. Now, each of these cells, uh, the effector memory lymphocytes, as well as being uh, in, I need to do some circles actually, okay, uh, as well as being uh, imprinted with a response to that antigen, or were also imprinted with a with a, a sort of a, a homing mechanism, a postcode, as it were, and that postcode are are the expression of integrins, which direct that lymphocyte back to the target organ where it's designed to have its response. So if a lymphocyte uh, was uh, differentiated in the lamina propria uh, or the mesenteric draining lymph node, it will express gut homing uh, uh, integrins such as alpha-4, beta-7, which can bind to the uh, endothelial expressed uh, adhesion molecules, in this case, uh, MADCAM, and direct that lymphocyte back into uh, the uh, lamina propria where it can react to its antigen in a whole range of different ways. And so when an effector memory lymphocyte uh, goes back into the uh, lamina propria, meets its antigen, it proliferates, it drives inflammatory uh, cytokine release. There's then a positive feedback mechanism, often signaling through a receptor pathway called the jack stack pathway, which perpetuates uh, that inflammatory response. Now, in addition to the circulating uh, lymphocytes that express alpha-4, beta-7, come into the lamina propria and have their response. There are also uh, some uh, tissue resident memory cells, and these bind to the epithelium uh, using uh, alpha-E uh, binding uh, to E-cadherin. So if we then think about the different drugs that we're using, uh, they act on different steps of this pathway. Perhaps we're almost familiar uh, with the anti-TNFs, and they have a range of different uh, mechanisms of action. They mop up uh, soluble TNF, which is one of the pro-inflammatory cytokines signaling through a jack stat and TNF receptor pathway. Uh, they uh, also induce apoptosis of TNF expressing cells, which are many of those effector memory cells. So effectively, anti-TNFs eliminate the effect of memory response to some extent. We then have the anti-integrins. Uh, Obviously, we're most familiar with vedolizumab. That's a direct anti-alpha-4, beta-7, and therefore prevents the ingress of the effect of memory lymphocytes from the circulation back into the lamina propria. We're going to be hearing a little bit about etralizumab, which is an anti-beta-7. So it both targets alpha-4, beta-7 signaling, but also that alpha-E, beta-7 binding uh, to e adherin uh, for the tissue resident memory cells. Um, we're very familiar, obviously, with erstakinumab, uh, which is an anti-P40. P40 is one of the subunits that makes up both IL-12 and IL-23. So erstakinumab has an impact on the differentiation of both Th1 and Th17 effector memory lymphocytes, as well as impacting the function of uh, the uh, activated effector memory lymphocytes when they're in the uh, lamina propria. We're going to become familiar with the anti-P19 class of drugs, uh, risinkazumab, merinkizumab, caselcumab, and brazicumab, uh, which target purely the P19 subunit and therefore only block signaling through the IL-23 pathway, and therefore have a much more focused impact on the differentiation of Th17 cells. Finally, uh, no, no, not quite finally, Xanamod and Atrazimod are modulators of the S1P pathway, and therefore they impact, uh, among other things, I suspect, the emigration of effector memory lymphocytes once they're differentiated in the mesenteric lymph nodes. And now, finally, the JAK uh, inhibitors that in 
uh, with a variety of different uh, specificities and sensitivities impact uh, uh, the, the class of Jack uh, receptors, uh, which are a heterogeneous group of dimerized proteins uh, uh, signaling from the outside to the inside of activated lymphocytes, but also uh, many of the other mononuclear cells. So um, what I have hoped to do in that very uh, brief, slightly fast moving uh, uh, introduction to uh, the uh, pathways targeted by the new drugs is put everything into context at the point within the therapeutic, uh, point within the uh, pathogenic pathway that these therapies are working. And I'm now gonna pass uh, on to Peter to discuss the first of the clinical trials. <coughs> Sorry, that was my chair. Uh, lovely. Uh, thanks, James, and thanks for that uh, really excellent introduction. Uh, uh, it beautifully, clearly explained immunology for those of us who aren't immunologists. Um, it, we've actually had our first question. Oh, right. It's not about immunology, though. Oh. No. It's about it's about the handout, uh, and uh, the question is: Is the handout downloadable? And the answer is yes. But um, at the end, I think. Well, I don't know. I've just clicked on it, and uh, uh, and it it seems to take you to a PDF, I think. Anyway, anyway it, it is downloadable, yeah, but it, it, it looks like uh, you just click on it and it opens in a new window and then you can just save that. So, yes. Anyway, back to the presentation uh, and we're going to start with Serene. And of course, Serene isn't new uh, to us. We've seen some of the um, uh, results of Serene already. Uh, the, uh, last year, I think we saw the first results and certainly earlier this year. And it's about high dose adalimumab in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease because I think there was always a feeling that perhaps adalimumab was underdosed. Particularly but, in ulcerative colitis. Particularly in ulcerative colitis, absolutely right. And maybe that was the explanation why the ultra program, you know, the difference over placebo, no, well, the difference was there, but the actual sort of, the results were maybe a little disappointing. Uh, anyway, so so we're gonna go through some of the later results now of Serene, which were released at UEGW, but let's just remind ourselves of the original study design. So on this slide here, you can see the trial design for Serene CD. Uh, so, uh, 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 you know, as previously, this is a, a fairly standard group of patients with Crohn's disease, a CDAI of 220 to 450 with mucosal inflammation as defined by the SCSCD. They're an early group, they're bio-naive, uh, or at least infliximab uh, 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 failures were limited to less than 25%, so largely a bio-naive cohort. And what you can see from the, uh, from the trial design here is that they were randomized to two arms. Uh, the arm at the top is pretty much standard induction, 160, 80, 40, 40, the, uh, the purple bars being placebo, but the bottom arm was high dose induction. That's weekly injections of 160, four weeks, so pretty full-on induction, as you can see. Um, and, and then the primary endpoint from there uh, was uh, what happened both at, uh, at week four and at week 12. But then you can see it moves on into this re-randomization phase at week 12, in which people were either randomized to a clinically adjusted arm or to one adjusted by therapeutic drug monitoring. And that's the bit we're interested in. Let's just remind ourselves before we do that, that in fact, the primary endpoint, that is clinical remission at week four or endoscopic remote response at week 12, which is the now often used drop in SCSCD of 50%, no difference between high dose and standard dose induction, which, you know, I, I think, think surprised. Yeah, I think that is, I mean, you know, when we look at the exposure response uh, data for adalimumab in Crohn's disease, for example, coming out of PATS, people with higher drug levels seem to do better. And, and that's consistent across lots and lots of studies. And, and I think we'll come back to why that might be a bit later on. So let's go back to that re-randomized group after 12 weeks who are randomized to a therapeutic drug monitoring arm or a clinically adjusted arm. And over on the left-hand side of the slide here, I'm just gonna to explain to you how these two arms work. So the top area here is the clinically adjusted regimen. So if you had a CDIR of less than 220 and a CRP of less than 10, then you carried on on the same treatment. If you had a CRP of greater than 10, regardless of your CDAI, you dose escalated. If you had a CDAI of greater than 220, regardless of your CRP, then you dose escalated. And you went up to every weekly adalimumab in that situation. In the TDM arm, 
if your levels drop below five, whatever the clinical parameters, you dose escalated. If you sat in what was taken to be the therapeutic range, that's between five and 10, if you had no symptoms and your CRP was normal, you stayed on the same dose, but if either your CDAI was greater than 220 or your CRP was 10 or more, then you dose escalated to every week. And if you had greater than 10 in terms of your adalimumab level, it didn't matter what your clinical activity was, you stayed on the same dose. And that that that's interesting, isn't it? Because 10 is not that high. No, and uh, let's come right. on and so, in just a moment. Right. And so, you know, uh, and so and so what were the outcomes and of course one has to point out here all these outcomes are exploratory but nevertheless you saw no difference in clinical remission at week 56 based on a CDI of less than 150 no endoscopic difference in terms of response or remission no difference in deep remission that's a combination of clinical and endoscopic and no difference in steroid free remission so I, you know, I think we can we can argue here about whether they chose the right the right dose. And what was the difference between the uh, clinical escalators and the TDM escalators in the number of patients that ended up on weekly during the study? Do we know that? Yeah, and that's absolutely key because 84% of patients uh, ended up. Oh no, that's sorry, that's in the uh, that's in the next study. Ignore that. Uh, so. Uh, uh, vast quantities of the patient I can't I'll have to go and check the abstracts I've forgotten uh, vast quantities of the patient ended up on uh, every week yeah and so you can see comparing weekly adalimumab gone one way to weekly adalimumab gone another right, way right right indeed and you could but you can see interestingly that the main driver in the dose uh, for the TDM, TDM arm was low adalimumab levels and that sort of suggests that you know maybe weekly is better because low adalimumab levels is was less than five, and that is low. That is low. Whereas in the in the clinically adjusted arm, it was CRP, in other words, disease activity. So, I mean, those two will go together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so we know the higher the uh, inflammatory burden, the lower your levels. I think what I take away from Serene Sidiers, induction is not underdosed in Crohn's disease. Maintenance probably is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, let's go on to Serene UC, and I won't spend quite so long on the study design here because it's almost the same as Serene CD. The induction arm is the same. Again, a uh, weekly induction of 160 versus standard induction. The re-randomization re is a little bit different because there the arm split between 40 every week, 40 every other week, and again, a TDM arm. Uh, so, uh, 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 again, uh, uh, I'm not going to show it this time, but the primary outcome after induction, no difference. And, and again, I think that's a bit of a surprise to us. Let's just have a little look here at the difference in the TDM arm compared to the last study, because here the dose banding is different. Again, there's this, uh, 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 there's a sort of clinically adjusted part to it. So if you're in what they call the therapeutic range here, which was 10 to 20, that's very different to the Crohn's disease. Yeah, quite. Right, yeah, pretty much twice as high. Um, exactly twice as high. Um, uh, if you were in that arm, then it basically, basically, if you had uh, uh, rectal bleeding, uh, then you uh, then you dose escalate, and if you didn't, you didn't dose escalate. If you were over twenty, which I think most of us would agree is probably in the therapeutic range, it didn't matter if you had rectal bleeding, you didn't dose escalate, and if you were less than ten. Uh, then whatever happened, you dose escalated. So it's it, it's very different dose banding, but again, it's a more aggressive TDM yeah. uh, arm here. And just look at the dose escalation at the bottom here, because that was different as well. Uh, if you were on 40 milligrams every other week, you dose escalated to 40 milligrams weekly. If you then flared on that or met the criteria for dose escalation, you've got a reinduction dose of 160 and then went on to 40 weekly. Uh, 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 and in fact, if you were in already on the 40 every week arm, then you went straight to reinduction and then had another reinduction if you flared again. So it was really aggressive okay. adalimumab dosing. So let's look and see what happened. Look over at the results here on the top right hand side. And this is looking at clinical remission at the end of the study uh, in the patients who were week eight responders. Uh, and this is remission based on the Mayo score, and it's pretty standard. So if you're in the 40 milligrams every week arm, you did better 
uh, than those patients who are in the everywhere other weak arm, 39% versus 29%, and that's statistically significant. If you're in the TDM arm, then you were pretty close to the 40 milligrams every week arm. Why is that? Because nearly everyone in the TDM arm, 84% of them dose escalated. As you can see on this graph at the bottom here, looking at the serum concentrations, what happens is everyone ends up dose escalating pretty much 84% of those patients. I mean, that, that suggests that in the longer term, you know, the higher doses of adalimumab are better. Although, you know, if, if you were to look at that objectively, you'd say, well, even with escalated dosing and occasional reinduction of 160 milligrams, uh, you only get steroid-free remission in 40% of patients. Which probably fits with reality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, that's probably our, that's probably our bar in biologics, isn't it? Steroid-free remission, true steroid-free remission in clinical trials probably hits about yeah. 40%. Calm was about the same. Right, exactly. So, you know, I, I, I think it tells a lot there. Uh, so uh, so uh, let's move on from there. And we are going to go on to a trial that we're including. Uh, it's a really exciting trial because it's one of the few randomized controlled trials of a biologic in the pediatric population, looking at adalimumab in moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. You may remember that REACH was the uh, Crohn's study. Uh, this is the uh, uh, UC study. Patients were randomized to high dose adalimumab or standard at dose adalimumab for induction. And then at week eight, they were randomized to one of three arms, placebo, standard dose, or high dose adalimumab. Uh, and you can see on the slide here in your handouts what the doses were for pediatric populations. Fair to say that Although that was how the study was designed, uh, after a period of time, uh, the uh, high-dose uh, adalimumab induction became standard of care and was open label, and so the standard dose was removed. Uh, and then after another period of time, uh, randomization to maintenance placebo uh, was removed. So although it started off as a, a nicely controlled trial, uh, a few patients towards the end to, in order to get numbers uh, were not part of that protocol. And here you can see the outcome. And again, large numbers of patients coming through, uh, looking in, in purple here for those that did have the standard, in, uh, the high dose induction compared to standard dose uh, in the pediatric population, suggesting an advantage, although it's difficult to make statistical comparisons here in terms of response and remission uh, numerically between the higher dose and the standard dose. And then over the course of the maintenance, uh, again, looking at response and remission, you can see very similar data to that that we might see in the adult population, perhaps even uh, slightly higher uh, induction data. Uh, so uh, important because it was a nicely designed pediatric trial, which is something we rarely see. I'm now going to move on to uh, the uh, first of the sub-Q uh, abstracts that we're going to present, uh, and this is the uh, vedalizumab sub-Q. Now, the reason for including this is, of course, because we're beginning to get vedalizumab sub-Q coming through into our clinical practice, and I think we need to look and see some of the lessons from the trials uh, in terms of how we use it. So the um, key um, uh, trial was called Visible One, in ulcerative colitis. And we've seen some of this data before. We're really going to focus on the open label extension study, but let me just remind you of the visible trial design. This took a group of patients uh, and everyone received open label intravenous vedalizumab infusions at weeks naught and two. Those who had responded at the week six uh, time point were randomized to either receive true placebo sub-Q vedalizumab with placebo IV or IV vedalizumab plus placebo sub-Q. So it's a double dummy, double blind, placebo controlled trial. Uh, and that uh, randomization was continued through to the end of week 52. In important to note, and this will become of relevance later on, if you were a non-responder at that week six endpoint, you received a third dose of intravenous vedalizumab, and then at week 14, if you had responded, you went straight on to subcutaneous in the uh, open label extension. 
The open label extension uh, took patients at the end of the 52 week uh, and uh, people uh, moved on to the subcutaneous dosing. So this is the week 52 primary efficacy analysis. This has been presented before, but effectively it was powered to show a superiority of sub-Q vedolizumab uh, over uh, placebo. And you can see here, comparing the dark blue to the light blue, clear evidence of uh, superiority with remission endoscopic improvement and durable clinical response uh, at the week 52 time point, with no obvious differences between ongoing uh, IV and switch to sub-Q. What we're interested in, the new data here, I think, comes from uh, the open label extension. And I think the important bit from here are twofold. One is, it seems that if you are uh, switched to sub-Q after your first two IV maintenance doses, the red line, uh, you carry on and you seem to have a nicely, uh, a nice maintenance of response over the open label extension, pretty much what we would have seen within the Gemini uh, IV open label extension. It's the blue line here that I think is quite interesting, which is the group of people who were already on IV and doing okay, who switched to sub-Q at any point during uh, their follow-up, they also maintained a nice remission. And I think this gives us the reassurance that we can switch patients who are on established IV therapy to sub-Q without a lack of efficacy. The other bit of data is from that group of patients who were non-responders at week six who received the third dose uh, of uh, IV um, uh, vedolizumab, so they had 026 IV and then switched to sub-Q. And you can see here, non-responder at week six, a good chunk of them responded to that third dose and then a nice maintenance of response. Uh, so I, I guess we can give two or three IV doses for new starters then switch to sub-Q, and we have the option of switching our established IV patients onto sub-Q dosing. Um, have you done much switching yet? Yeah, so we have both started new patients, and we have also um, uh, 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 switched patients. We've switched about 30 patients, and we've certainly had no issues at all. Yeah, we've, uh, we've not not actually gone down that line too much yet, but uh, uh, but we're certainly intending to. Now, before we move on to the next, uh, there's actually a few questions coming hey, through, cool. which I've been looking at whilst you've been nattering away. Um, and, and Debbie's posted something about how to download the handout. So it is, it's straightforward. You definitely can do it. Um, so the first question I'm actually going to save till a little bit later on. Uh, the second question relates to adverse events in Serene. Uh, and the question, really sensible question is, did the high dose regimens, uh, 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 were they associated with increased adverse events? To which the answer is a pretty straightforward no. Yeah. And I think that fits with, in general, biologics. Absolutely. The, the, it's not like small molecules where you have that right. really neat dose dependent uh, side effect uh, profile in the biologics, because of course the dose you give doesn't actually necessarily always reflect the levels that are achieved in a patient. Uh, you don't get an increase in side effects. So I don't think we would have expected an increased side effects. And it's not just about dose not relating to levels, but levels don't relate to side effects either, presumably beyond a, a threshold right at the very bottom. Yeah. But, you know, basically it's the presence of the drug rather than the concentration yeah. of the drug, which sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then there's a very good question here. Uh, for maintenance adalimumab in UC, based on these data, you could probably also extrapolate this to Crohn's disease in a way based on the data, should we just abandon every other week uh, dosing and just give weekly to everyone? I mean, to be honest, looking at the data, I think you'd have to say yes. I mean, it's now a biosimilar. It's not quite cheap as chips, but it's not, inex it's not, it's not too expensive. And the alternative is people lose response and switch to vedalizumab, which is much more more expensive. So although obviously uh, from a CCG perspective, I'm not sure they've got buy-in from this, but I mean from the data, the answer is yes, everyone should be on weekly, I would think. And I think, you know, uh, it, knowing how little some of the biosimilars cost nowadays, yeah. still you could, you know, not that there's any evidence to do it, but you could basically put adalimumab in the tap water uh, and uh, and it probably might be somewhat against uh, 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 but anyhow I, now. can we just can we there's uh, it, it, there's a one more question here 
which is it says why the difference in serene and i think that's referring to why the different drug levels and i think that's just uh, because that was based on the pharmacokinetics um uh, uh that were used at the time so we'll come back to some more questions but uh, in the meantime uh, i think it's time for a video Hello to everybody, my name is Silvio Danese from Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan, and it's a real pleasure to present you the data of the Stardust. The Stardust trial is the first treat-to-target study that investigates the benefits of a treat-to-target strategy with two stechinumab therapy combined with early endoscopic assessment compared to a clinically driven standard of care approach. Let me walk you through the study design in order to be a little bit more uh, clear. So these are patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease that have a CDI between 220 and 450 and a CCD of at least three points, either biologic naive or exposed to one biologic that after endoscopy have been receiving ustekinumab according to the classical induction of six milligram IV and then 90 milligram sub-Q at week eight. And this is the first point. This is the first target. As you know, CDI 70 response is the first target for patients responding, they could continue in the study. And patients were randomized into two groups. This is actually the second part because half of the patients, according to their drop of CCD at 16 weeks, were continued in a schedule of every eight weeks if the drop was below 25% or every 12 weeks if the drop was above 25%. And then the same patients continued in the trip to target arm monitored, and this is the tight control part monitored for uh, fecal calpro and CRP. On the contrary, the other half of the patients were randomized to the standard of care group in which Typically, according to the European label, patients could receive dose optimization of ustekinumab up to eight weeks. And the primary point, which is the third target, was endoscopic response at week 48. So differences in CCD drop of 50%. So these are all the adjustments that occurred. And as, as I said, symptoms, fecal calpro, and CRP. And if patients do not achieve the target, they are removed from the study. This is a huge study, it's a very robust study with over 680 patients assessed. Something that I want to draw your attention is that there is a very high drop um, in the treat to target as compared to the standard of care, because of course, if we are too ambitious, it's possible that the patient will not copy or will not achieve the target. These are all the dose distribution with all the assessment in the treat to target it was possible also to optimize every four weeks as you see here in about 17 percent of patients and uh, this is the primary endpoint numerically higher in 37 percent of patients in the treat to target as compared to 29 percent of patients in the standard of care and uh, something that is relevant is that the drug did perform extremely well in both terms in terms of response CDI 100 response, remission, these are all the analysis, and actually also in terms of drop in CDI score over time, and also in terms of biological response. So I would say that overall, and including the safety, with no problems of new safety signals between the treat to target or the standard of care. So this overall leads to the conclusion that in this first randomized treat to target trial, we could not detect a difference, a significant difference in the trip to target, but still this produce a numerically higher endoscopic response than standard of care with excellent clinical remission and biomarker response in both arms with a great safety of the drug. Thank you very much for your attention. Good. I'm back. Lovely. Uh, uh, hello. We just did. We had one comment there that someone uh, said there was no sound. If um, I'm assuming because it was only one comment that other people could hear. Uh, so, but please do let us know if that isn't the case. Um, so, uh, uh, thanks to Silvio for uh, for presenting that. Uh, let me just click here. That might help me move through the slides. I'm not going to go through this in great detail because you've just heard all of this. 
Uh, I think I might just pause on this slide, James, because one of the things that concerns me here uh, is that the treat to target arm, the, 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 the dosing actually wasn't that different to the standard of care arm. If you look over on the right hand side here, only 17% of people ended up on Q4. If you add those together with the Q8 treatment, you know, it's, 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 about, it's about half, isn't it? Which is about the same as the patients in the standard of care arm. Yeah, I mean, I was really disappointed with the design of this trial because I think there's one key question that we want to answer in a randomized controlled way, which is this, does escalation to four weekly offer advantages? Right. And the trouble is this trial gives us a hint that it might without actually giving us the answer that it does. And there's, so, there's yeah, that yeah, hint. There's the hint. Right, yeah. But, then, you know, there might there might be something in it, uh, but uh, but it probably doesn't provide the answer, yeah. unfortunately. And the trial probably was never going to because of its right. design. They only randomised people at week 16, only 17% escalated to four weeks. Right. It probably could never have detected a difference by the end of one, one year. I think, I think the only thing is, it is fair to say that it's very easy to criticise trial design once oh, yeah. you've seen the results. That's true. That's and true. Uh, yeah, so because you might have imagined that more people would dose escalate through the arms, and you know, yes. uh, anyway, you live and learn, don't you? Um, it, one of the things that potentially could be interesting in Stardust uh, is this: the the the, the PK sub study, yeah. uh, and uh, Hit Hans uh, represent uh, sorry presented these data. Only out to week 16, and it'd be quite interesting to actually to see the data out to, to the end of the trial. Um, uh, and what you can see here, and in fact, I I'm going to show you two studies now that look at astrocinumab PK, is that the clinical response and clinical remission data, when you look at the quartiles of astrocinumab concentration, there's just not much going on here, is it? If you look at week 8, week 16, either response or remission, it's pretty flat. You know, there's no differentiation here, even with the lowest quartile where you get the, you know, the slightest hint. There's just not much going on there. But what happens if you start to look at some of the other harder endpoints here, CRP, fecal calprotectin, now we're starting to see a dose response curve. So yeah, it, it, brings, it brings two obvious possibilities to my mind. One is that, you know, Crohn's disease, there is a disconnect between inflammation and symptoms. The other is that maybe this is just a marker for mucosal healing, because of course, one of the things that we know, oh, that's maybe not fair. One of the, no, we do know, we do know. Uh, one of the things we know is that if you've got a lot of ulceration, you will leak, uh, we, you'll leak protein into the bowel, and that includes biologics. So again, the, uh, the, the group from the AMC showed this uh, uh, many years ago. Um, and maybe what we're seeing here is those patients with high CRP and high fecal calprotectin are those who have ulceration in their bowel and therefore they have lower drug levels. So yeah. it could be association. So it's cause or effect, isn't it? Is it that right. the people in high drug levels have more objective markers mean that higher drug levels drive those markers? Or is it the opposite, in fact, that it's just the fact that if you're going to have high drug levels, by definition, you must have healed your mucosa? Right, exactly. So, um, uh, uh, so uh, and then, in fact, looking at the endoscopic outcome uh, at, uh, at week 16, when they all got a repeat colonoscopy, you can see, again, there's certainly a suggestion here that the mucosa or the mucosal response maybe associates in some way uh, with, the, uh, with the drug levels. And in fact, I'll very briefly show you this, which is another PK study. So this is looking uh, at this time in UC, so UNIFY. This is looking at the open label extension two year data. And again, uh, I'm not going to show you this, it's the trial design, we don't want to see that. I'm going to show you the relationship between the core quartiles of, uh, of the drug levels uh, and some outcomes. Here we see symptomatic remission. Does this remind you of Stardust? Yep. Absolutely. No difference between the quartiles and symptomatic remission. And of course, this is long-term data, whereas Stardust was in week 16. Induction, induction data. Um, uh, but when you start to look at this harder endpoint, which probably again relates in some way to mucosal inflammation, now we're starting to see a little bit more of a, con a convincing uh, exposure response relationship. And again, I, you know, I, I think it's uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that it's very difficult to decide whether this is cause or, or effect. Um, uh, oh yes, this is interesting. Final point: antibodies to astrocinumab. Uh, 
Um, uh, so this is looking at the percentage of patients who had antibodies. It was extremely low. Only 1% had neutralizing antibodies. Other antibodies probably aren't relevant. And most importantly, those uh, antibody positive patients, there wasn't a, an association with symptomatic remission. Um, should we see what, uh, what questions uh, we have had come in? Uh, so let me see if I can get my computer to behave over here so I can look at the questions. Uh, all right, uh, so um, here's a question, James. Does all this data, this is the first question that came in, I've been saving it. Does this data mean we shouldn't be using, therapy? we don't need therapeutic drug monitoring? To be fair, the questioner asked this after the, uh, after the serene data. Yeah, so um, I, I think the answer to that is for anti-TNF, yeah, I think we still do need therapeutic drug monitoring uh, because with anti-TNF therapy, we have that causal relationship that we know that uh, decision making based upon drug levels can impact outcome. So we know that in patients who have low drug levels and high antibodies, there is no value in escalating those, whereas in people who lose response uh, with high titers of antibodies, we know that there is value in switching drugs. So, so it does guide decision making. I have to say, with vedolizumab and erstikinumab at the moment, I do not know how to, in, how to act on drug levels. So I think that's probably still a work in progress. Yeah, I think, you know, occasionally drug level uh, uh, um, interpretation is incredibly easy. A drug level of zero is really easy to interpret. And a drug level, you know, let's be silly, uh, an adalimumab drug level of 40 or yeah. high, you know, is, is very easy to interpret. And in fact, one of the questions here is, you know, does a drug level, uh, what, what do you think of a drug level of 20 and you see, is that a good cutoff? Well, it's certainly if it's above 20, then no, uh, then it's, it's yeah. in the therapeutic range. So we're going to move on to the last of our conventional therapies, and this is uh, the riveting study. Uh, and Severine is very kindly going to talk us through uh, the, river, uh, the riveting study, uh, tofacinib dose. In the next few minutes, I will present you the results from the double-blind randomized riveting study, which looked at the treatment outcome of tofacitinib dose reduction to 5 mg BID versus remaining on 10 mg BID in patients with ulcerative colitis in stable remission on 10 mg. So this is an ongoing phase 3b4 double-blind randomized parallel group study. All patients receive tofacitinib 10 mg BID for two or more consecutive years within the open label extension study, they were in stable remission on that dose for six or more months prior to enrollment, and they could not have received corticosteroids for at least four weeks prior to enrollment. Patients were randomized to either remaining on tofacitinib 10 mg BID dose or to reducing their dose to 5 mg BID. And you see that there were 70 patients in each arm that were included and randomized. The primary endpoint at month six was defined as the modified Mayo score remission. And this was defined as a three component Mayo score. The endoscopic subscore could be one or zero, stool frequency subscore could be one or zero, and the rectal bleeding subscore had to be zero. And this summarizes the results. You have a number of outcomes presented here. You see always in green are the patients who reduced the dose to 5 mg BID. And in blue, you see always the patients who remained on the 10 mg BID dose. The primary endpoint of modified Mayo score remission is seen here in the top left. And then you see that numerically patients remaining on the 10 mg BID did a little bit better, but overall patients could safely and also efficiently reduce their dose to 5 mg BID without losing remission. And this was also seen for the other endpoints of total Mayo score, remission, endoscopic improvement, clinical response, and so on. So always you see that the green bars perform numerically about 10% less uh, but um, overall, the patients remain in remission. When we look at subgroup analysis, then it was clear that especially those patients with a baseline endoscopic subscore of zero and the patients who had not 
been um, failing TNF blockers, that these patients were especially the ones who remained well when they were reducing their dose as compared to the prior TNF inhibitor failing patients and the patients who had still an endoscopic subscore of one. So these six month data from the riveting trial show that most patients in stable remission on tofacitinib 10 mg BID maintenance maintain remission after dose reduction to 5 mg. For those patients who reduce their dose to 5, those with a baseline endoscopic subscore of 0 and those without prior TNF inhibitor failure were most likely to remain uh, and maintain remission. There were no new safety risks identified and we feel that these findings may guide clinical management of patients with ulcerative colitis who are treated with tofacitinib. Thank you very much. Cool, thank you uh, Severine for that. Uh, and again, I'm not gonna spend ages on this. I guess, I guess Pete, one of the things I think from this, and we've discussed this before, but is you know, how many patients do we have who've been in stable remission for two years on 10 milligram twice daily? Because we're sort of trying to get our patients down from that dose anyhow. Yeah, uh, I mean, we do push our patients quite a long way out, actually. Um, uh, if, they're not, if they're not doing well, then we keep going with the 10 milligrams. And I think, in fact, the riveting data kind of support that because the, the risk factors for failure were endoscopic activity uh, for, for relapse, sorry. So after, after those de-escalation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I agree. I think we probably shouldn't be inappropriate patients scared of keeping people on 10 milligram twice daily for a bit longer. And the right. other thing we do is we often put people back up to 10 if they flare rather than give them rescue therapy with steroids, bearing in mind, of course, the bit that I'm going to come on to in a moment, which is the side effects. Right. Because unlike biologics, of course, in which we've just said the side effects are not particularly dose dependent, uh, certainly the infectious and zoster related side effects of tofacitinib are very very much dose dependent. Well, one of the things that may come out in riveting uh, is uh, is looking to see if there's a difference between because you could get into you could get into it several different ways. And one of the ways you could get in is by early relapse in the maintenance program of uh, of the top of Sydney program. Yeah. So in, so in fact, you, not all of them have been in remission for two years. So at some point, they may be able to compare those patients who've been in remission for a long time versus a short time but at the moment they've got so few events and it's it, that, that that they can't compare it so i'm just going to update some of the other adverse events for uh uh and that's the malignancy rates and this is uh, malignancy rates in the open label extension and clinical trial program uh for all patients and what we're looking at effectively is at the top the induction of the octave study in the middle the maintenance and then overall uh, and obviously in the induction and maintenance we have placebo uh, and what you can see here is looking at all cancers apart from non-melanoma skin cancers in fact that you know in the induction and maintenance the only cancer event occurred in the patient on placebo if we then take it to the open label extension including uh, the 2019 data cut you can see there were a few malignancies uh, slightly numerically more in terms of incidence rate uh, in the uh, 10 milligram twice daily, but you can see wide crossing uh, of the confidence intervals here. So not as clear a dose dependent increase in malignancy uh, in the open label extension. And here on the right hand side, uh, we can see what those uh, malignancies were. Uh, and my take as I've looked through this is that there isn't really a particular signal that any malignancy is more common than another. How, how useful is uh, is this data set in terms of defining whether there's a malignant risk? And, uh, and no, I guess nowhere near nowhere near big enough. Uh, and I guess you know uh, it, it, I think do you come on to to non melanoma skin cancer? Yeah, it's coming next. Time. Okay, I'll let, I'll let you do that. But I mean, the answer to your question though is, is how useful. It is. It's not that useful if you remember. Uh, with the uh, question as to whether uh, uh, antitinef was associated with the risk of lymphoma, it took a study of 200,000 patient years of follow-up to get that, and we're just absolutely nowhere near that with this. Uh, and then this is the slide you're asking for, Peter, which is non-melanoma skin cancer. Here, a slightly different thing. You can see that certainly in the uh, 
you know, a, a little bit of a greater signal for uh, a, a risk of tofacitinib. And again, here in the maintenance call, hold perhaps a little bit more of a dose effect, although when you come to the overall cohort, again, uh, widely crossing uh, error bars. And I, I mean, of course, then here it comes is because we know that people stack up their risk of non-melanoma skin cancer based upon uh, years of exposure to immune, relevant immune suppression. Of course, the majority of patients have had prior azathioprine, which we know to be a risk factor for non-melanoma skin cancer. So, uh, you know, I think this is a work in progress. Would you be surprised if there was a, a no, non-melanoma skin cancer? No, not at all. Signal? No. no. Um, uh, should we have a quick look to see what questions have come in? This, uh, a few bits and pieces. Right, okay, in fact, you can answer this one, James, because you presented it. Any experience in weekly subcut VEDO? No, simple answer, no. I think it's a really good question, um, uh, uh, but we don't have experience of it. I guess one has to be a little bit careful because we know that receptor occupancy with vedolizumab at standard dosing is massive, and 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 the, the whole exposure response for vedolizumab is far less clear-cut than it is for anti-TNF. So, so no experience and not sure that I know what would happen should it be relevant. But dose escalation works with intravenous, it despite, to, despite amazing receptor occupancy. Yes, it seems to, for reasons that are still slightly lost to me. A little bit, little bit unclear there. Fine. So moving on, I think you're next up, Pete. All right. Uh, yep. What have we got? Is it P19? It is P19. P19. Okay. So gaselkumab uh, is, uh, is one of the anti-P19 uh, antibodies. James mentioned uh, uh, the others at the start, brazicumab. Mirakizumab, Gaselkumab, and uh, the AbB1 Rizinkizumab. Uh, and, and, and this is actually this is a trial that uh, I think I, I've partly been waiting for because the real question to me is is P19 as a mechanism of action going to be better than P40? In other words, is anti IR23 uh, a better way of treating Crohn's and UC than combined? 12 and 23? And of course, from the psoriasis data, we saw a really exciting signal different doses, of course, in the, that indication, but a really exciting signal that Rizinkizumab was better than Erstikimab. Right, and, and so this trial here was a, a Janssen trial looking at their two agents, Erstikimab uh, with Gaselkimab, uh, to see if there was a, a difference here. At least there was a reference on Erstikimab that helps to answer that. It is, it is also, of course, a trial to look to see if Gaselkimab is better than placebo, and we mustn't forget that. So look, um, it, it's a phase two study. We've got gaselkumab at 1,200, 600, and 200 uh, out to 12 weeks, given every four weeks. Ustakinumab is a reference arm with standard induction dosing with another dose at week eight. That's what we always do versus placebo uh, in patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, let's just go straight to results here. Uh, number one, placebo is not a very good treatment for Crohn's disease, it would appear. Uh, but number two, gaselkumab at any of the doses at which it was given uh, is certainly better than placebo. But interestingly, not much difference to ustekinumab. And again, you know, the reason I was interested to see that is for the reasons you state exactly, namely that there was that really interesting data in psoriasis that it would appear that P19 seemed to be a bit better. But so this is a phase two trial with smallish numbers, so I guess we have to wait and see, don't we? It is, and, and I think the dosing potentially is interesting yeah. as well. And you know, I, 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 I might be right. I think the dosing of gaselkumab in psoriasis is uh, is like a hundred. I mean, it's completely different. Yeah, um, I mean, it's striking though because in in the phase two trials of rizinkizumab, the other P19 in Crohn's disease, we did see a dose response. So it's like you know, we've not got a dose response here. Right. But anyhow, but. But different drug. So uh, I think there's lots of different there's lots of different outcomes. I'm not going to spend time on them because basically they're all pretty similar. There's a hint that the patients who are biologic failures do slightly less well than the patients who are conventional therapy failures. And again, I think that's not 100 percent surprising, given our experience in uh, with other biologics, including uh, anti-P40. Um, uh, if you look at the other endpoints, then no real change across the different dose regimens, either in the biomarker response or here the endoscopic uh, response. Let's uh, move on to uh, Mirakizumab. Now, at the Mirakizumab uh, program, this is Lily's drug, uh, and they have, they're pretty far advanced in ulcerative colitis. I think they're probably closest to to revealing their results. Uh, they're a little bit high, behind some of the others in Crohn's disease. 
um, uh, certainly behind Risen Kizumab, which I think is closest. But here's some data uh, from uh, from Mira Kizumab. Uh, this is probably the most difficult trial design uh, to present uh, at any time. Uh, basically, you have in this phase two study one, two, three different induction regimens. That's either a thousand milligrams, six hundred milligrams, two hundred milligrams versus placebo. Then after that, they get randomised within each of those dose bands to continuing the same or swapping to a subcut dose of 300 every four weeks and that's the same throughout each of those uh, each of those dose bands and those patients who didn't respond then go on to uh, a, 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 a treatment with high dose mirakizumab every four weeks so there's lots going on here i think there's probably not much to draw out of this okay because it's small numbers uh, and it, what's presented here is an aggregate of the results in each of these different arms put together. And you can see we're talking about nine patients responding in each arm. I think the thing to take away is that both at week 12 and at week 52, we're seeing response rates here um, uh, uh, in our patients of 50, 60 percent, whether they're on IV or subcut with remission 15 to 20 percent endoscopically when you go out to a year 30 odd percent this rings right doesn't it i mean this is what we keep yeah. seeing these sorts of I these mean, sorts this, of results this will give them strength to know that the iv dose works and you can switch to sub q without a loss of benefit and right I mean, probably that's all we can take I, I think so there is another side here and i think i'm just not going to go into it symptomatic response and remission but again uh, probably what we see in general uh, in in these studies. So so that's the end of the P19 data. Do you think, James, has your opinion about P19 changed with UEGW? Not yet. I don't think. Uh, as in, as in, is it likely? Is it possible that an anti P19 might be better than uh, a skinemab? Um, and and the simple answer is I don't think the data is strong enough to answer that question at the moment. I, I, I mean, I think we can certainly say that we haven't seen definitive evidence that it is, yeah. but I'm not sure uh, because in the Galaxy trial, it was just a reference arm, it wasn't power to detect a difference, uh, and obviously Mirren um didn't include a P40, but of course we will have the Abvi Risen Kizumab Erstekinumab head-to-head yeah. uh, -head trial just opening now, but obviously the readout for that will come in some time. I have to I have to say, I was thinking that I'm slightly less hopeful that P19 is going to be a lot better. Than, yeah, let's you know, wait slightly to, less let's hopeful. Wait That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so um, we are now going to move to a little bit of a discussion of etralizumab, uh, and I think if I can find her, we have Iris uh, to just introduce the key results. So uh, Iris uh, Dotan. Uh, is now. Hello, I'm Iris Dotan from the Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva, Israel, and today I'd like to present to you our UEGW 2020 late breaking abstract, etrolizumab compared with adalimumab or placebo as induction therapy for ulcerative colitis. Results from the randomized phase 3 Hibiscus 1 and 2 trials. Etrolizumab is a novel gut targeted anti integrin. It has a dual mechanism of action whereby anti-beta-7 monoclonal antibody selectively targets alpha-4 beta-7 and alpha-E beta-7 integrins uh, expected to control both trafficking of immune cells into the gut and their inflammatory effects in the gut lining. Hibiscus-1 and 2 studies were designed in order to evaluate the superiority of utrilizumab versus placebo or versus the dalimumab for induction in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis who were anti-TNF naive. Uh, these randomized phase three studies had their primary endpoint at week 10, and primary endpoint was defined as induction of remission at week 10 compared with placebo, and remission was defined as Mayo Clinic score two or lower uh, with individual subscores of one or lower and the rectal bleeding subscore of zero. Overall, the baseline characteristics were uh, evenly distributed 
across, across all study arms and in both studies. This is the study disposi disposition. 358 patients were enrolled in the Hibiscus 1 and Hibiscus 2 studies. And of note, a high proportion of patients uh, uh, reached the week 10 measurement point. The primary endpoint of Hibiscus 1 and 2 is presented here. In Hibiscus 1, the primary endpoint of remission at week 10 was met. Significantly more patients achieved remission at week 10 with atrolizumab. It was 19.4% of patients uh, compared to 6.9% uh, of patients treated with placebo. In Hibiscus 2, however, the primary endpoint of remission at week 10 was not met. There was no difference in remission at week 10 between patients receiving atrolizumab, which was 18.2%, compared with placebo, which was 11.1%. The key secondary endpoints for Hibiscus 1 and 2 are presented. And in a pooled analysis of comparing etrolizumab versus adalimumab, etrolizumab was not superior to adalimumab for induction of remission, endoscopic improvement, clinical response, histological remission, or endoscopic remission at week 10 as presented. The safety summary is presented here, and most adverse events were non-serious and grade one or two. There were no new or unexpected safety, safety signals. There were two fatalities that were reported, both occurred in the etrolizumab arm and were uh, con considered unrelated to, uh, to treatment. There were no confirmed cases of PML in these studies. So to summarize, our summary statement is as follows. Overall, mixed results were demonstrated in the Hibiscus 1 and 2 studies. As etrolizumab met, as etrolizumab met the primary endpoint of inducing remission at week 10 versus placebo in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis who are anti-TNF naive in Hibiscus 1, but not Hibiscus 2. The pooled analysis did not show a superiority of etrolizumab over adalimumab for week 10 endpoints, and etrolizumab treatment was well tolerated in anti-TNF naive patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis. Cool. So that is the uh, initial etro data. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do just for a few slides now is, is run through the whole etrolizumab program. Don't forget, etrolizumab is the anti-beta-7, so it should have the same efficacy as vedolizumab in impacting alpha-4-beta-7 signaling, but also impact alpha-e-beta-7, that's the tethering uh, to the epithelium via e cadherin. Now, this was an amazing program, a really ambitious and a really insightful program in that it included both induction and maintenance studies. It included both placebo controls, but also head to head with anti-TNF agents. And you can see the variety of different studies here, and I'm not gonna run through them hugely in detail. But I mean, you know, a really ambitious program designed to answer important questions. And sadly, the outcome is in summary here, if you look, at the induction or maintenance endpoints, the only ones that were met were the one uh, induction endpoint hibiscus that uh, that that uh, uh, Iris has just told us about in anti TNF naive, and one induction endpoint in anti TNF exposed patients with the Hickory trial. All other induction and maintenance endpoints were not met. Does that mean the drug does not work? Well, of course, as ever, uh, the answer to that question is slightly more complex. And I'm just gonna show you a selection of the key uh, outcome slides uh, that I've picked from the various presentations. So this is the data that to some extent Iris has already been through. Hibiscus one and two are induction studies for anti-TNF naive patients. And Hickory is an induction study for TNF uh, exposed patients. We saw before that uh, in the uh, uh, Hibiscus 1, we got a nice uh, benefit over and above placebo, uh, but in Hibiscus 2, it failed that. And then in the anti-TNF exposed patients, a nice benefit above uh, placebo. And of course, one of the problems here, if we look at the figures here, are the end numbers. And I suspect these the studies were just simply underpowered. Look at some of the end numbers in the other new agents that we're about to show you now. These were trials of three or 400 patients. If we look at the comparison data, 
Uh, this was designed to show superiority of etrolizumab over adalimumab. Given the uh, varsity data, clearly this is something that should interest us. But again, the numbers probably simply are not large enough. But irrespective of the power issue, it's very difficult to say that there is a signal of benefit of etrolizumab uh, over and above adalimumab uh, in any of the endpoints looked at. Again, looking now outwards at the maintenance endpoints, uh, Laurel is anti-TNF naive, open label induction, randomization and maintenance, Hickory TNF exposed, all the way through study, uh, realistically no signal of benefit over uh, placebo. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that the drug doesn't work, it might be that those patients who've had induction drug and then get randomized to placebo have a carryover effect, similar to that what we saw with the phase three erstikinumab trials, because the placebo rates here, 20 odd percent, yeah. are quite high. We're normally, you know, when we're looking at remission, uh, rates of 30, 25 to 30 percent of what we see with all the agents. Maybe the placebo rates here are really high. Yeah. But of course, again, the numbers, the numbers, uh, 100 people in each arm is simply not enough. And then this is Gardenia, which is the anti TNF naive. A uh, group of patients randomized etrolizumab, infliximab head to head. Well, certainly not a signal that etrolizumab is any better than infliximab. Pretty much equivalent uh, dosing. So, so my sort of feeling from this is is a really exciting, uh, insightful uh, program of clinical trials and a really disappointing outcome. And and I'm not sure from this that I would say that etrolizumab is an ineffective agent, but it doesn't matter what I say because Roche have discontinued the use uh, and the ongoing marketing of etrolizumab and ulcerative colitis, so it's not a drug we'll use. The Crohn's program is ongoing. And we'll see what happens there, but uh, indeed that's one of the questions. Is there a you know, is there a position for it? And uh, and the answer is uh, we don't get to make that choice. No. Uh, do you know, James, the thing that I, that upsets me most about this Partly, of course, is that, you know, it's a drug that probably does do something, probably, but, but that we're not going to get access to. But also that I think it will make drug companies very conservative in their trial design. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to go back to those big, big placebo controlled 900 people in each arm induction studies, two of them with no excitement. And, and it was a really lovely trial program. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. All right. Moving on. We're heading to the last 20 minutes, we're going to finish on time somehow. Uh, so we're going to look at the selection trial. So this is Phil Gottenib. Uh, we're all familiar with tofacitinib. We've heard about it a little bit earlier on. Uh, uh, tofacitinib is a pan-JAK inhibitor, really, but targets uh, JAK1 and JAK3, whereas tofacid, uh, sorry, uh, Phil Gottenib is a, uh, a JAK1-specific uh, inhibitor. Uh, and this is the selection uh, trial, and this is looking uh, at the uh, uh, the data in this phase 2b3 trial in patients with moderately to severely active uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, let's look at the trial design. Uh, you can see there's two cohorts, cohort A, cohort B. Big program, 700 in each arm. Compared to 200 in each arm with the actualism right indeed uh, and they're biologic naive versus biologic experience and you can see they're randomized to two doses of phil that's 200 or 100 versus placebo induction going out to week 10 and then re-randomized thereafter to continue the same uh, uh, uh dose of 200 or to go uh, to placebo 100 versus placebo and then placebo non-responders continue on the same dose what do we see? Clinical remission at week 10 being the primary outcome. You can see that 200 was better than placebo, but 100 wasn't in study A. That's the biologic naive patients and very similar in the biologic experience patients. That is 200 was better than placebo, 100 wasn't. If you then look at endoscopic remission at week 10, very similar results uh, uh, in the biologic naive patients. Interestingly, didn't reach the end point in the biologic experience endpoint. I, I, you know, early, early week 10. Right, early. But nevertheless, it didn't quite make it. Uh, and then if, uh, and then if we look at histologic remission, uh, you know, maybe we can get into this discussion at some point, but it mirrors the endoscopic remission pretty much as you would probably expect 
uh, histology uh, it, it, it behaves in the same way as disease activity and you see. And then obviously, if you just nip back one, uh, oh, clearly there's, uh, there's the, the, the normal uh, l uh, lower delta in terms of biologic experience compared to biologic naive. Right, you know, almost twice as good in biologic naive as biologic experience. Right, which one would probably expect in induction? Yes. Um, it, it, so it, looking at adverse events, uh, and this is important because Philgotinib, as we know, is JAT1 specific. So you might think there could be a difference in terms of uh, efficacy, but clearly you also might think there might be a difference in the safety profile. Where might you see that difference? Well, one area you might see it is infections. Tofsidinib has a bit of a zoster signal, so let's look at that now. Uh, you can see here an induction placebo, there wasn't any zoster, the 100 dose, there was one case, the 200 dose, there were three cases, so a little bit difficult to tell there maybe. And then of course the other place that you would think about is, uh, is in venous thromboembolism, and let's face it, uh, in, a, uh, in an early induction study like this, you'd be very unlikely to see a signal, and indeed I don't think you see anything here at all. I'll go on to the main. You look like you're going to say something. I'm going to go on to the maintenance study uh, so that we can look at this as well. Uh, and here we're looking at clinical admission uh, at week 58. Now again, uh, you can compare 100 to placebo here, 200 to placebo. They both actually meet this endpoint here of clinical remission uh, at week 58. What I don't think we had in the study design was people inducted with 200 then going to 100 okay. maintenance but and that and that's a bit of an unanswered question and of course these are randomized responders so that 40 yep. percent is an a randomized yep. responder group yeah uh, which is not dissimilar again to many to many of the other uh, patients if we then look at corticosteroid uh, uh, free remission we see that 200 meets this endpoint whereas 100 doesn't and then we look at endoscopic remission again we're seeing 200 meets the endpoint, 100 dozen, and histological remission the same again. So we're, we're seeing a message here overall, 200 is better than 100. 100, it's not quite clear where this dose is gonna fit in, whether it's gonna be licensed or not. I think, I think we don't know the answer to that. But let's again go back to the side effect profile here. We've got a bit more data now because we're going out to a year. And let's look again at the zoster. Now we're not really seeing now a signal here, are we? Much more reassuring. Right. Much more reassuring. And, and for me, I think one of the great disappointments of this trial design is that we haven't probably seen the top of the dose efficacy curve, i.e., 200 was definitively better than 100. What would 300 be like? What right. would 400 be right. like? Would that push the response rates up? Because although that induction data did show a sort of dose dependent increase, yep. you know, they were only two or three cases. Here, a much longer period of time, yep. and we really see no cases, no significant cases of Zoster. Uh, so I, I think it would have been nice to push that up a little bit higher. We're going to bin through this quite quickly because we're running out of time. Yeah, go on, let's let Bill. Yeah, so we, we were going to say, <laughs> should I do a Xanamod or should we let Bill? Let, let, but let the Bill. answer is we're going to let Bill do the uh, Xanamod. Don't forget, this is the sphingosine uh, phosphate, stops the effect of memory lymphocytes, leaving the mesenteric lymphocytes. Hello, I'm Dr. Bill Sanborn from the University of California, San Diego. It's my pleasure today to present the abstract entitled Xan for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis efficacy, safety, and histology results from the induction and maintenance periods of the phase three True North study. By way of introduction, Ozanamod is an oral sphingosine 1-phosphate, or S1P, receptor modulator that selectively targets S1P1 and S1P5 receptors. Ozanamod induces peripheral lymphocyte sequestration, decreasing the lymphocytes circulating to areas of inflammation, including the gut. Ozanamod was recently approved by the EMEA and FDA for the treatment of relapsing multiple sclerosis. Ozanamod demonstrated significant improvements versus placebo in endoscopic, histologic, and clinical endpoints for moderate to severe ulcerative colitis in a phase two study, and has been studied in more than 3,000 people. The True North trial is a 52-week phase three clinical trial conducted to assess the efficacy and safety of ozanamod for the induction and maintenance of remission in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis. Here are the induction efficacy at week 10, 
The primary endpoint was clinical remission, which occurred in 18.4% of patients who received ozanamod one milligram per day, and 6% of patients who received placebo. This, just, this difference was statistically significant. The rank secondary endpoints, including clinical response, endoscopic improvement, and mutable healing were all also statistically significant. Here are the maintenance efficacy data at week 52. The primary endpoint was clinical remission, which occurred in 37% of patients who received ozanamod and 18.5% of patients who received placebo. This difference was statistically significant. Secondary endpoints included clinical response, endoscopic improvement, maintenance of remission, corticosteroid free remission, mucosal healing, and durable remission. These differences were all statistically significant. So, in conclusion, in this phase three clinical trial in patients with moderately to severely active ulcerative colitis, treatment with ozanamod led to statistically significant improvements in all primary and key secondary endpoints for induction at week 10 and for maintenance at week 52. Oral ozanamod during induction and maintenance led to clinically meaningful improvements in clinical and endoscopic endpoints. Thank you for your attention. Apologies for the slight delay there. Um, so I think one of the things, uh, again, we're going to come through these animals. These are the slides that Bill has already shown. Uh, I think from the induction perspective, we see a really nice signal of benefit. But again, of course, there's just one dose tried here. We see a really swift uh, uh, induction dose there, separation between placebo and drug at week two. And again, if we look here at the prior antitinef and the no prior antitinef at the induction dosing, 18.5 versus 23 uh, from the clinical response perspective, perhaps slightly less of a difference. Um, I think the key thing for Xanamod is going to be safety. Uh, if it proves and turns out to be a much safer drug, uh, then that will have real attraction. The trouble is, of course, at the moment within its license, uh, you have to be thinking about ECGs and ophthalmic reviews to exclude macular edema. From the maintenance perspective, uh, to my mind, the most striking data is uh, on the delta in terms of response and remission between prior anti-TNF, if you look at that uh, 18 and 30, and no prior anti-TNF if you look at that 18 and 14. This is one of the few drugs at maintenance for which patients seem to do as well whether they have or have not been previously exposed to an anti-TNF. And obviously in the maintenance arm we get a little bit more uh, data on safety. And the bottom line is that, that there's not a huge signal here. I think there was one or two cases of Zoster. It's not here in the slide, but if I remember rightly, uh, from the trial program, uh, it looks like, a you know, it, it certainly has no adverse safety signal. But of course, within clinical practice, you will have to be doing ECGs in those at risk of cardiac disease, uh, uh, referring patients to an ophthalmologist if they have diabetes. Pete, do you think that will put people off using the drug? Uh, I mean, I think the the cardiac side of things. If you look at the if you look at the data on the sort of the reduction in beats per minute, I think the the median is about one beat uh, per minute or it's something. Probably not relevant. I was going to be in the license, so so yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Doing an ECG is not that big a deal. We do chest X-ray. You know, the the bigger point actually is exactly is the eyes and uh, and things like that. But um, but do you remember? I, it, when I was a house officer, we used to admit people for their first dose of captopril. <laughs> people used to be admitted for for, uh, uh, for when they started ACE inhibitors because yeah, they were worried yeah, about. Right, of course, no, I've right. got that. And, trial of ACE inhibitors. Right, Don't exactly, care. exactly. And so it wouldn't surprise me if, in fact, it turns out to be all a bit of a, a palaver for no great deal. The one, the one thing I'm a bit interested in, we got time. Yeah, we got time. Um, is uh, is the lymphopenia? What do you, what do you make of that? Oh, I think that's really important. And uh, so uh, 
So, I mean, this comes, I, 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 we'll, we'll skip over this section so we can discuss this. Because uh, the Trazomod, this is the open label extension from the similar drug, not much exciting to say. But I think the really- You just stole in my section. Yeah, but it's all right, go on. But I think the really interesting <laughs> thing is uh, what the relevance of the lymphopenia is. So um, both the Trazomod, we skipped over, and uh, Azanamod, same uh, mechanism of action, cause a dose-dependent lymphopenia. Uh, and we know from huge previous studies that lymphopenia is a really negative prognostic factor for serious infections. From uh, big studies from China, uh, the azathioprine data. So I guess to me, there are two things that I think are relevant. Firstly, uh, I think that uh, it worries me for future risk of infection. And secondly, I don't quite buy why a drug theoretically is mechanism of action is targeted purely on egress of effective memory lymphocytes from the mesenteric lymph nodes should cause such a dramatic lymphopenia. I mean, we're not talking about the whole lymph cycle, we're just talking about the mesenteric lymph nodes. So um, I suspect we'll find in time uh, uh, that actually uh, these drugs have much, much wider uh, mechanisms of action than that they are purported to have. And that doesn't surprise me because, uh, you know, we know that many cell types uh, have S1TP express, for example, all dendritic cells do. And yet, you know, so, so yeah, I guess we'll wait and see. But, but let's remember that we shouldn't necessarily extract the dangers, if you like, of lymphopenia through different mechanisms of action. Yeah. Extra extrapolate. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it, yeah, it, it may be it may right. be different. So the azathioprine induced lymphopenia may be completely different to this. And of course, you're absolutely right. And and the data we have realistically reflects azathioprine induced lymphopenia. You want uh, to talk about fire? I'm going to finish with this because it is a I thought a really neat study. There are several things I really love about this study. Uh, one is it's purely uh, nurse-led research. This is an intervention, a trial of an investigation on medicinal product, which is purely nurse-led, a great, a great thing. Secondly, it deals with an issue for which we have very few options, and that is uh, chronic fatigue in patients with quiescent disease. We certainly will all know that that is a big clinical problem. And this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial of high-dose thiamine. Uh, in order to understand this trial, we need to understand the fatigue assessment scale, or so-called IBDF. Uh, and realistically, this is a terribly straightforward scale. Uh, there are five questions you can score uh, uh, between naught and four, rating your fatigue now in the last two weeks, how bad was it in the last two weeks, what was it like on average in the last two weeks, and how much time have you felt fatigued in the last two weeks. So a series of questions all sort of tackling the same issue, scores from naught to 20, the normal uh, in the healthy population is a fatigue score of seven, and you can see here the 90 and 95th centile. 40 patients, so a small trial and perhaps too small, all of whom had at least uh, uh, three months of remission in, in terms of IBD, and they were in remission. Their mean, feel, their mean fecal cow protection was only 51 microgram per gram. So these were a group of quiescent IBDs. They all scored significantly higher than 95th centile on the chronic fatigue scale. They were not anemic and they had no comorbidity that could explain the fatigue. And as said, they were randomized in a double blind, dumb and dubby crossover trial way to high dose thiamine based upon weight and sex. So the primary endpoint was a fatigue improvement of at least three points on the IBDF. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to work out how to, uh, to uh, understand this, but effectively we've got two periods, green and red, uh, and of course it's a double blind, double dummy crossover trial. So uh, in the first period, blue was receiving thiamine, red was receiving placebo, washout period. In the second period, red was receiving thiamine, blue was receiving um, uh, placebo. And here you can see the number of patients meeting the primary endpoint in both treatment periods significantly greater than placebo. Stats there, number needed to treat three. Now this is a small trial, but I mean, 
might make you want to reach for your thumb in pot when your next patient with uh, fatigue comes to your clinic. So, um, James, let's see if you can remember the answer to this question because I asked you last time. Uh, what is the highest dose thiamine tablet available at the moment? So, you're right, they have to take 18 tablets to get high dose thiamine. Or if they're in the, right, so 80, it's quite a lot, isn't it's it? It's a lot of thiamine, but, 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 yeah, I guess, I guess, certainly, I think it's a really interesting, and I, it's been published in APT this week, actually. Oh, so, has it? Oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. So, I, I think probably uh, it needs to be validated. Uh, I'm going to let Pete sum up for us. Okay, so I'm just going to say that, in fact, of all the studies, I do know people who've actually started prescribing thiamine uh, based on this. Well, so, since last Thursday? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> People, people are starting to do it. I'd, lo I'd love to know what people's, uh, yeah, well, uh, people's responses back. are. But, uh, but we're, we're nearly at, uh, we're nearly at eight o'clock. I should think people's scores on the IBDF scale have gone up by at least three points over the last hour and a half. Uh, so I think it's time for us all to say good night. Uh, once again, thank you enormously to our supporters for their educational grants: Amphi, Amgen, Galapagos, Tillots, uh, uh, Takeda.